Shalom Promise Center, Chadwick, Heidi, the team, everybody that's there. We are so grateful to bring this word to you. It's been burning in us, and we're excited about the Father's love, which we're going to be experiencing in a new way in this new season. Yeah, so we look forward to seeing you, and we just bless you with God's peace and his shalom in this time. Yeah, can't wait to see you again. God bless you. We are just so thrilled to be in this particular season. We're in a season that is on the Hebrew calendar, the Lord's calendar, but also is speaking around the world to the church of God. We were just in uh, Texas with Chuck Pierce, every tongue and every tribe worshiping together in their own costumes, in their own regalia, in their own way of speaking to the Lord. I mean, we had the Africans and the Spaniards and the Hawaiians and the Inuit, the Eskimos, the Native Americans, and even the Jews. We had everybody there worshiping together and that's kind of God's thing right now right his thing is diversity unity in diversity and we as the believers of God we're carrying that sense of unity we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace what is unity this is not my message by the way but what is unity it's something that comes from the spirit it's not always agreement sometimes we need civil discourse when we disagree example if you're married you know that you can be in unity and disagree about everything. <laughs> and if you're single and courting, you know that. And if you're going to get married, you're going to find it out. And if you have roommates, you'll know that. If you have a boss or an employee, you will know that. You can be in unity regarding the bigger picture and still have disagreements on a daily basis. What God's trying to do with us is help us to model civil discourse where we can actually disagree but recognize the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So this message is called, Let Us Return. Say that. Say return. return. We are in a season of returning. You know, and, and for us, it's like, uh, what I really want to talk to you about in this is first love. Say first love. God wants to bring us back to our first love during this season. It's pretty noisy out there. And in the midst of all the noise, God wants us to return to him and to return to our first love with him. You remember when you became a believer? If you're not a believer yet, today is your day. Wherever you're online or in the overflow or whoever's watching this, today is your day to become a believer and a disciple of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus the Lord. Can I have some water? You know, thank you. We are on a calendar. It's a phenomenon to me that what's going on in the USA, all the chaos and all the difficulty is leading us towards something new. Something's trying to break forth. And we're in that season, a breakthrough. We heard it here. Great songs today. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us or follow up or get this message or whatever, you can see us at mkhop.org. That's Miles Catherine, House of Peace. Org. You can find us there. Uh, you can pick up our book, which talks about these issues. I had no idea when we wrote it over a year ago, published it over a year ago, that uh, a lot of the material that's in our book, When Heaven Hits Home, is useful for right now. I'm doing a lot of online counseling with people who are dealing with the stress of this shutdown, the stress of the economic shutdown, of the masking, of the parameters that have been put around us. And God wants us to elbow our way out in the spirit to stay above it so we can be an answer to those around us. Amen? And that's what's going on right now, that we're, it's up to us. So we're in this season of the fall feast, as Caleb said. Uh, right now, we're in this time of, um, we're, we're, I'm just going to talk about all the feasts together because they, they, um, they kind of run, come as a group in the fall in this way. Why is it relevant for a Christian to know? Why do you need to know about the feast? Because every feast has a historical meaning with Israel. It has a prophetic meaning. It points to Jesus. They all point to Jesus. And they have a personal meaning. If you tune in, you can hear God speaking to you personally. Just as Pastor Caleb said, you can be healed during the service at any time. You can receive a miracle of insight, of revelation, of a breakthrough. God can speak to you about something that you weren't asking about. Has that ever happened to you? You're begging about, begging about something and God answers something completely different on this side. It's a wonder. Turns out he knows everything. You know, he never says, hey, I just had an idea. <laughs> That's us. God is omniscient. He knows everything. And so 
we're in this season right now, and I don't know if you're catching the hope in the midst of the headlines. I've just started a podcast called The Hope Behind the Headlines. It's called To Life. We're hoping to launch it in about a month or so. I'm developing the, the sessions right now. And the reality is that we need hope. We need to see the hope behind the headlines these days. Can you say amen to that? Amen. If you're watching the news, you're in trouble. I watch the news. I am in trouble. I have to turn it off and turn on God. I have to turn it off and turn on praise and worship. I have to turn it off and get vertical so that I can remember my first love and not allow the news, left, right, or indifferent, to sway me and get into the noise that's surrounding us right now. We need to hear the word of the Lord. So I'm excited about what's happening right now around the world. You know that, that this season, actually since Passover, there have been thousands of people gathering online to be led in prayer and communion and worship by a born-again Jew and an Egyptian, born-again Egyptian in Israel, together leading us all, Isaac and Ishmael, coming together in this day from Passover going forward. Do you know that Franklin Graham was in the mall recently? Do you know that Sean Foyt, you know Sean, he's a, he's a brother of this house, brother with Caleb. Sean Foyt is pushing the envelope of worship. Let us worship. Let us worship. Let us worship. There's beach me meetings happening in Southern California. The local churches are going out into the parks and singing and worshiping. Jonathan Kahn was holding a huge uh, return message this week recently. And, and it's all happening at this time when there's this spiritual battle to try to tamp down, shut up the church of God. And God is wanting us to be forward going in our faith. Amen? You got to yell because I can't hear you behind the masks. So, we, yeah, there you go. That's it. Come on. So we're talking about the false feasts and, and a signature of the fall feast. Let me get to this in a moment. But. There's, as Caleb said, there's three major feast times. At the, it's called Shalosh, say Shalosh, Shalosh. Regalim, Regalim. Shalosh Regalim, the three pilgrim feasts that were gone, going on for thousands of years where the Jewish people would come up, the, the head, head of the house would come up to Jerusalem three times a year. And it has incredible implications for us regarding, as Caleb said, our offering, which is spirit, soul, and body primarily, but also includes treasure, our offering to the Lord, but especially it's our giving ourselves to him and meeting with him during these feast times. The essence of the feast of the Lord is not ritual. It's not ceremonial. The essence of it is communion. It's communion. So the, the feasts come in these three time periods. The spring, Jesus fulfilled the first four. There are seven total in three periods. I know it's confusing. Some wise guy years ago, I think a rabbi said, God is, God is hard to understand because he's first one, then three, then seven. <laughs> and that's the case. And the fact is that these three feast periods are Passover, Shavuot, or Pentecost, we call it in the church, and Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Teruah, the day of blowing. The, 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 fall, the, the, the spring feasts have been fulfilled by Jesus. He came as the Passover lamb. He was buried as unleavened bread. He had no sin. Leaven is a picture of sin. He went into the earth with no sin. And then he rose on the third day, which is the Hebrew day of first fruits to the Lord. He's the firstborn of many brethren. Because he did that, you are risen. Because he did that for you, you are risen. And you are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. I didn't have a bright idea to follow Jesus. I don't know about you. I did not, I was not looking for Jesus. This beautiful girl told me at our first cup of coffee, she liked me, but she was in love with someone else. She was recently born again. Devastating to hear that. She said, if you, I was a Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, wandering Jew, new age, post drug addict, whatever. I was kind of, I had God as I understood him, which means I didn't understand him. We should change that to God as I am running from him in my case. She said that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Messiah of the Jews. Craziest thing I ever heard. God moved on me supernaturally. It's in our book. It's pretty amazing stuff. That he, did. he moved heaven and earth to get a hold of me because I was a stiff-necked person. And so the spring feasts have been fulfilled. The fourth one is Pentecost, or we call it the Feast of Weeks. It's 50 days after Passover. And that was fulfilled when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church in Acts and why did he take that time? Why was it that day? Because everyone was in town. 
Everyone was in town for the Shalosh Regalim. They were already there. That's why they could be gathered. That's why the Holy Spirit came. That's why 3,000 got saved after 120 got touched by the Lord. And it kept growing from there because God knows what he's doing. And then fall feasts, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. I won't give you the Hebrew and bend your heads. But I thought we could, what we could do today is as we welcome in this season, as we believe into this season, that God wants to give us a shout. I have a whole message about you are the shofar of God. Not doing it tonight. Today. Where are we? I don't have that with me, but it's online. It's somewhere in our, in our stuff. However, I want to say that in this generation, you are the shofar of God. You are the one that is proclaiming by the word of your testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and not loving your life unto death, you're proclaiming what happened to you and what God wants to do for others. And he wants to bring everyone into a first love with himself. And that's the season we're in. So I'm going to ask Brother Dave to come and blow the shofar. And when you hear it, when the last one blows, I want you to give a shout, you're the shofar, and clap your hands to the Lord as we welcome this season. Lord, welcome. You are welcome here, Lord Yeshua. Hallelujah. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. You are welcome here. Yes, Lord. So this season actually begins in the summer. You know, we talk about the ten days of awe between between uh, Rosh Hashanah or the Yom Turah, the day of blowing the trumpets, and the day of atonement. But really, this begins in the summer, in the month of Elul. Say Elul. What is Elul? This has been established for about 6,000 years, about 5,700 plus years that we've been keeping these dates and following these calendars. And it's amazing to me, if you had asked me 25 years ago when we first started going to Israel and doing the Jewish ministry, if you had told me that some, the day was coming when churches around the world would be leaning into these messages and understanding our connection with the ancient people, it's just phenomenal to me. It's the greatest thing I've seen in a long, long time. The month of Elul... It begins in the summer, and it starts the 40 days leading up to the Day of Atonement, and it includes the days of all, the 10 days we're in. And it's time to make New Year's resolutions on a certain level, but it's also a bridal calling. The month of Elul is a call to the bride to meet the king in the harvest field. You see, the king is in the field. No mask can keep you from sharing the goodness of God with someone in your family, a friend of yours, someone else. The king is in the field as we speak. He's looking for us in the harvest field. Some great stories about the meeting of the bride and bridegroom in the harvest field, especially in Genesis regarding Isaac and Rebekah. I won't do that today, but Elul is an acronym, the E-L-U-L in English, but it's Aleph Lamed Yud Lamed. It is an acronym for Ani Lidodi Vidodi Li, which is from the Song of Songs, Song of Songs 6-3, and it means, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. So this month of 40 days leading up to the book being written, leading up to the Day of Atonement and sins being cleansed, etc., is actually a love story. It's the story of Elul. It's the story of, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And God is calling you and me Back to our first love. He's calling us to our first love. And that's how this works. You know, you think repentance is, I'm going to discipline myself, I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing, I, 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 and then you fall on your face. Really, what, the way this seems to work is it's a wooing. It's a calling. It's a yearning on the heart of God. And when you open yourself up and say, God, give me, just like you gave me the faith to believe in you, give me the faith for my first love to return. Give me the faith to come back to you in a new way. And then he'll give you strategies and ideas about how to do that, whether it's the word or worship or whatever it is, whether it's letting go of something, because we're in a season of fasting. Maybe God's asking you to stop something and start something. That happens. Happened to me about three weeks ago. 
Ani lidodi vidodi li, vidodi li, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. It's a time of soul searching and appeals for forgiveness. It reminds us of the high calling to examine ourselves as the spotless bride. And folks, we are in a season right now where we're seeing playing out in our midst and in our society and around the world whether the bride or the beast is going to have ascendancy. Is it going to be the bride in love with Jesus and exalting Him and loving this world and loving the people of this world and expressing His anointing and His love? Or are we going to be part of the beast kind of this animalistic low-down thing of, of, of just tension and violence? We need to decide. We need to be those that are manifestation of the bride of Messiah during this season. So here's what the Feast of Trumpets says. Speak to B'nai Israel. Speak to the children of Israel. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you're to have a Shabbat rest, a memorial of blowing, the shofarot, the shofars, a holy convocation. You're to do no regular work, and you're to present an offering made by fire to the Lord. There's something about giving during these three feast periods that is, has an anointing on it for your own good, for your own well-being, for your own prosperity, for your own answered prayer. And then we're going to come into the Day of Atonement. The Lord spoke to Moses. This is Leviticus 16, 29. The, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, however, the tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur, a holy convocation to you, so you are to afflict yourselves. It's a day of fasting and prayer. It's a day of of leaning into the Lord for the Jewish people. Here's the good news that Catherine mentioned. If you are a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach, if you received Him as your Lord and Savior, then all these feast days point to Him. And if you've received forgiveness, then you do not need to follow this to the letter of the law. What you need to do is Thank God that you've been saved by grace through faith. Amen? Amen. That the blood of the Lamb has been applied to your life. And it also goes on to say you are to bring an offering made by fire to the Lord. So the question becomes, what is your offering? You know, for us, there's a certain kind of fasting that we're doing now leading up to these days. And what we've done for our ministry, we're, we're donating, we're placing a donation to Little Hearts Preschool in Jerusalem. You can see this picture, I hope. Maybe not. Yeah, there it is. It's the, it is the, here's their mission statement. Working to make a difference in the lives of children through a loving and nurturing environment that models unity amongst the Arab, Jewish, and international communities. It is fully staffed by Messianic Jews, that is, Jewish people who believe in Jesus, but all the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews are welcome to it. Why is that important? Because some nefarious people said, if you give me your children for one generation, I can change the world. That means the opposite is also true. If we can instill in our children the love of God and the tolerance of God and the understanding that we're one in the spirit, if we can instill that in our children from the very beginning, then they will not grow up to apart from that. They'll come back to it. So I'm really about this ministry. I love what they're doing. Uh, We met with them in Jerusalem and just thrilled with what they're doing. So we're glad to be able to support them. But what's the greatest offering we can bring to the Lord? Is it writing a check or putting in a credit card? No, that's important. It's important for the work of the ministry, that's true. But the greatest offering that you can give to the Lord in this season is you. God wants to take us from being believers to disciples. He wants to move us from depending on our pastors. Caleb and Rachel can't carry you. They will inform you. They will shepherd you. They will help you. They will have the word of the Lord for you. But God's trying to grow us up individually so that we are his disciples. So we're not looking to the left or the right. We're not looking around us, but we're looking to him to disciple us, to be with us, and to raise us up in ministry or in our lives so that we can minister. First ministry, of course, is family, friends and family, whatever else he calls you. And by the way, with this new season, I'm going to talk about the new year right now in a moment, but we're in a new year. It changed a few days ago, and the new year is about new assignments. There are some things you've been doing that God is no longer anointing. And there's some things you need to do that he's wanting to anoint. And we need to discern the difference. We need to ask him, God, is there something you want me to let go of? And there's some new thing that you're assigning me to. Why? Because Paul said in Romans 12, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That's all the noise. Left, right, up, down, all around you but be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
that you might prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. We need our minds renewed. Anybody else besides me need their mind renewed on a daily basis? You know, I love to quote Jesus, but sometimes Jack Nicholson gets in there. You know, I love to quote Jesus, but sometimes some smart aleck New York comment comes out instead. I got to backtrack and apologize and furiously look through the scriptures to find something relevant. Thank, thankfully, my counselees understand that and have a lot of patience for me. But you can't come empty handed during the season. You know, we see it played out in culture, in, in Jewish culture, in this way. Uh, this Jewish guy is going to go see his grandmother, but she's moved. So he called her and said, Grandma, how do I get to your house? This is pre-ways. How do I get to your house? And Grandma says, uh, well, you take a left at the McDonald's. You go down four streets, make a right. You take a, fourth, or take a, a left on 4th Street. Keep going until you get to 7th make seventh Street. You get to this address. That's mine. Then you come and you kick on the door, and I'll open it. And he says, kick on the door. Grandma says, well, you're coming empty-handed? We bring an offering. Catherine can tell you I'm OCD about when we go to visit somebody, I got to have something to bring, right? Maybe some of you are like that. It's actually biblical. You want to bring an offering to the Lord. It's good to bring an offering to your friends and family as well. All right. So now we're coming into the season of Sukkot or tabernacles. Sukkah means tent, tabernacle, um, outdwelling. It's, it's about those flimsy tents that they had in the wilderness, leaving Egypt on the way to the promised land. But it's much more than that. Scripture says it this way, on the, fi- on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruits of the land, you're to keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. The first day is to be a Sabbath rest, and the eighth day will also be a Sabbath rest. On the first day, you're to take choice fruit of trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the book, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Folks, we're coming up on a party. These feasts are meant to meet with the Lord. Most of them, many of them are about the solemnity of the holiness of God. And then there's some like this one that is all about meeting with the Lord and celebrating, partying. Party through your mask, please. Party, party, party. It's a feast of ingathering. It's a feast of harvest. It's God-centered. It's to remember his good works every day, all day. When we were first married, we invented the grateful game. We needed it. I needed it more than Catherine, but we needed it. Where every day we would mention to each other the things we are grateful for. One of the first assignments I give people in counseling is go home, and for the next seven days I want you to say a verbal blessing over your spouse. And they go, well, we made it three days. We made it four days. Well, I tell you, you will change the atmosphere of your home, and you will push out the word of the enemy, and you will uplift and strengthen your marriage and your family and your home, your roommates, whoever it is. Say a verbal blessing. The worlds were framed by the word of God. It's not just having happy thoughts about my wife. She's really great. I need to say thank you for preaching Jesus to me. Thank you for putting up with me all these years. Thank you, and God bless you today, and everything you put your hand to shall prosper. And say a verbal blessing. Why don't you just turn to somebody and say a verbal blessing? Quick, quick. (laughs) So as we're remembering his good works and we're rehearsing his good works, because the worlds were framed by the word of God, we're also aware of in these tabernacles that we spend seven days in, we're remembering the time in the wilderness, that's the historical, we're thinking about that this points to Jesus who is God with man, he is coming to tabernacle with us, he's come now to tabernacle with the believers, and he's coming, he's returning to tabernacle with the whole world, to be part of with us. But it also reminds us, these sheds that we spend seven days in, remind us of the impermanence of life. And if you're here and you're over 40, like me, you know how quickly this life goes. It's very impermanent. And so we have to remember, eternity is real. God can help us. People matter most. You know, life is short. We have to remember these things so that we keep the main thing the main thing in our lives. And that requires for me to be aware of my first love. I have to. I need it. You know, I don't know how God's going to do it with you. I'm excited to hear how that happens. You know, for me, I told Catherine, I'm going to take myself through Bible college again. And I happened to get, become, to come to faith when the Bible college was in its fourth semester. So I started with Jeremiah 
and the prophets and Daniel and Revelation. It was just rough. I just came, came in at the deep end of the pool, had no idea what I was doing. I'm looking for, where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Ah, Jeremiah. So I understand that, but I'm going through it again. Because he spoke to me so much that I want to do that again. I have my other Bible study that I do. I don't know what you do. I go through the Torah on a weekly basis along with the Jewish people. It's amazing if you get on that calendar how God will speak to you about your life on that calendar. So we're aware of the impermanence of life. We need to feed our spirit in a fresh and new way. And we need to rejoice. I love that song that we sang today, maybe more than one, about rejoicing before the breakthrough. Rejoicing in spite of the circumstance. Rejoicing in advance. You know, that's the blessing. That's why you bless your spouse. That's why you bless your kids. We do it every Friday night at a Shabbat service. We bless each other, husband, wife, children, friends, family, neighbors, visitors. Everybody gets a verbal blessing. Why? Because the prince of the power of the air, Satan, wants to twist your words and help you, make you misunderstand each other, confuse your language so that you are actually can be arguing about two different things at the same time. It's quite a phenomenon. Okay. So there are different ways to build this, this booth. But remember, it all points to two things. One is the impermanence of life, our gratitude for God. And I guess the third thing is I need a place to meet with him. I don't know if you have a special place in your house where you go to pray, but here's, some, some tradi- here's a traditional sukkah. This is one that you might see around anywhere in the world where people will build something like this and then go inside and someone will sleep in there, eat in there, have services in there, prayer meetings in there, and different ways. We had an awning in the back of our house that we would roll out and then de- decorate with fruits of the season and, and we would meet out there with our kids. Uh, but it's, it's impermanent. Do you see that? It's a picture of our flesh which goes away, the impermanence of this life, but it's a place to meet with God Here's a glamorous one. This would be glamping, the, the orange one. Go back a slide. Yeah, this is kind of a glam, a glam suka, a glam tent. You know, I, I like that one. That's kind of my, my speed. People were talking about camping the other day in counseling. I said, so camping for my wife? That's a four-star hotel. Okay, I'm joking. And this is an urban version. She might actually see this in Israel. Bang, bang, bang. All the, all the alleys are filled with suka. All the apartments above, the balconies they have them. We had, we had a service on Hannah's balcony where she had her sukkah built and then here's my favorite this is the sukkahs are us version uh, i don't know i've never seen one live but i love that they're selling them <laughs> i wouldn't buy it but anyway the idea is you're building a tent to remind us of where we come so let me tell you about the season we're in regarding the hebrew calendar and what the meaning of it is every hebrew letter has a corresponding number every hebrew letter can be related to a word and so this last year, 5780, did you know that we're not in 2020, we're in 5780? We're in both. But we just passed over from 5780 to 5781. And 5780 is very fascinating considering what we've been in for this season. Because the 80, 80 is the Hebrew word for mouth. It's the word pay. It's a letter pay and the word pay, and it means mouth. So I was thrilled when it turned 57, 8. I thought, man, we're going to declare the word of the Lord. It's going to be better than ever. And then, boom. Right? Shut in. Shut down. Shut up. Oh, oops. Sayeth the Lord. You know, what? what wait a minute. It's supposed to be 57, 80. And, and, and we're, being, we're being masked. And we're being isolated. We're being sheltered in place. We're being just cut off from each other. I I don't get it, God. What's going on? I thought this was a year and a decade to proclaim the word of the Lord. And I was struggling with it. And my Native American buddy, who I can rely on for stuff like this, he said, Miles, that's so you could shut up long enough to hear the Lord. And it really went through me. It's like, you know what? This has been a really good time to take time to say, what's the difference between my self-promotion, my thoughts, my concerns, my anxieties, my worries about this, that, or the finance, family, whatever it is, and, and yada, 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 all that stuff, and be able to get quiet enough to hear from God. So that now, as we're going into 5781, we can have the word of the Lord, because we've been listening And it comes from Psalm 4611 in many places. Be still and know that I am God. 
I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. You know that? In the midst of this thing that we're all going through, God is being exalted. God is being seen. God is being noticed. God is being spoken about and for and through us, through the people. He's being spoken to this world in new ways. I'm excited about it, folks. I feel like we're in a tr- season for overturning bad ideas and, and, and things that are encumbered about us and bringing us back to our first love and clarity about the Lord. So this 81, the, letter, the number one, which is a change, 80 being mouth, eight being the number of new beginnings, and Aleph being the letter that's associated with one. One is the first number, obviously, but it's also related to the letter Aleph. You say alphabet comes from Aleph Bet, which is the Hebrew version. The Hebrew version is, if you look at the Aleph, if you look at the first letter that is in the Hebrew lexicon, in the, in the dictionary, you'll see that in olden times, I don't know if you have that uh, first one, the modern picture, block letter, yeah. That's what it looks like in block letters today, right? But if you look at the history of it, because all the Hebrew language has pictographs. It was, it was a picture language before it was a written language as we understand it today. And it was, it was a sacred language before it was a conversational language. There's all this evolution that's happened spiritually in the language that is connected to the blessings that the church has. And that's another message as well. Every time God blesses Israel and the Jewish people, he blesses the church. Conversely, because of what God said to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. If you notice, there's blessing coming to America because we moved the embassy, because we recognized the goal on heights, because we said Jerusalem is the ancient capital, and because we're making peace with our Arab neighbors. That has come from you. That has come from the United States of America. That means we are set up for blessing. We're set up for blessing. In spite of what you may see right now, blessing is coming. Now, in the ancient language, the pictograph for this letter Aleph, this letter number one, is a, a, an ox. It's the head of an ox. Do we have that? Yeah, see that one? It says early. That's what the original Aleph looked like. The head of an ox. Why an ox? Because it signifies strength, leadership, fatherhood it's a picture of the first the primary the one and it's a picture for us of our father in heaven so when i was preparing this what god gave me and there's all these great aleph beginning words out there especially a lot of the names of god begin with the but it's el shaddai el gibor el elio and all these great names they have that aleph at the beginning but what god spoke me for you showed me for you is two hebrew words for this season For 5781, two Aleph words that you need to take in as you're looking for your first love, as you're asking God to return you. The first one, the Aleph word is Abba. Say Abba. Abba. Right? That's not father far off. That's not some distant guy with a gray beard in the universe somewhere. That is dad. That is father. Now for me, it's been a, a long, long journey. My dad died when I was 18. We were unreconciled when he died. So it's, for me, it's been an ongoing quest for the fatherhood of God. And thank, thank the Lord there's been some great men of God along the way that have helped me. And I'm telling you that because if you have a pain where father should be, this is your season to connect with your heavenly father in a new way. He wants to heal those wounds. And he wants to bring himself into the view screen as the Aleph, as the head, as the first, as the one that we need to know first of all. Abba. And the second word is Ahava. Say Ahava. And Ahava means love. It's an Aleph word. So this is what I believe we're in right now. God is wanting to bring us to our first love. He's wanting to heal our father wounds. And he wants to make this a season when we are expressing the love of the Father to others. That means we may have to be healed first. We may need a healing. And I preached a message similar to this it was month, uh, over a month ago. And, and uh, at the end, I did an altar call for, for father wounds. And this young man came to me at the book table and he said, my dad died last year. And I didn't even know I needed a healing until today. And God came and he healed me during the service. So as Caleb said, you can be healed at any time during the service. If you are wrestling with a father wound, 
or a place there's a hole where there should be an expression or an understanding of the love of your Heavenly Father. God wants to heal that today. How do we find the Father? I've got an idea. It actually came from Jesus, not Jack Nicholson. Jesus in John 14, Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Yeshua, Jesus said to him, have I been with you for so long a time you haven't come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but, my, but the Father dwelling in me does the speaking. So how can you find the Father? Look to Jesus. Look to the Son of God. He will point you to the Father. The love of the Father will come through to you as you give your life and your tr time, your treasure, your talent, whatever it is He's asking of you to Yeshua. So this is a time when we're in these booths, we're thinking of the impermanence of life, we're looking forward to the year that's coming up, we're recognizing we're come through this mask time, but we're going to be breaking out of these any day now, hallelujah, and the idea is that we're to speak and bless the ones around us in our homes and in our neighborhoods and wherever we are. You can be in the checkout line and have a word of encouragement for somebody. A friend of mine who's a, a maintenance guy at a local church that I work with, uh, he was in line in this, and he forgot to have his mask on. And this lady went off on him. And, and he just said, you know, I'm sorry, I left it in my car. He's like, he's distanced away from her. And so what he did, what did he do? He snuck around her and he paid for all her groceries. And so the lady had this experience of, you know, we can have a civil discourse about the difference regarding these parameters. But you know what? God loves you. God loves you. We can be, find a way to express that in every situation. Because this is a season of ushpizin. Say ushpizin. Different word, I know. It means hospitality. This is a time to be gracious, to bring an offering, to be a blessing, to ask somebody, to call somebody. One, one church we work with, we're, we're calling everybody that's ever been there to find out what they need, what's going on. You know, what, 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 we, what can we do to be a blessing at this time? Because when my kids were in preschool... They would come home and I said, what'd you learn today? And they say, joy. I said, what's joy? They said, Jesus, others, you. I held that over their heads the whole time they're growing up because, you know, it's true. Get out of yourself. Mobilize. Give. Do. Go. You know, mobilize yourself to get out of the funk that's trying to take away our strength. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for in doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. It's also a time of tzedakah. Say tzedakah. tzedakah. It means generosity or charity. Like we're going to give to this preschool in Jerusalem, where is it, all these projects we're working on. You know, find some place to give that you can express something that gets, out, gets you out of yourself. Answering the king said to them in Matthew, Amen, I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And Luke said it this way, Jesus said it this way. He replied, they asked him, what's, what's the law and the commandments? This is the one minute Torah. Back in the day, somebody came to Rabbi Hillel and said, uh, Hillel was Gamaliel's teacher. Gamaliel was Paul's teacher. So there's a lineage there. They said to him, if you can teach me the Torah, the laws of Moses, the books of Moses, while standing on one foot, I'll become a Jew. And the, and the rabbi said, that which you don't like, don't do to others. The rest is commentary. Go study it. He replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. How am I going to do that, Lord? I've got to get something from you. I don't have it in myself. I need to remember first love. I need to experience first love. Now, the tabernacle scene, the tabernacle's uh, era is a time when in Jerusalem there would be a water ceremony and a light ceremony. And there would be a procession of peace, priests that would go from the Pool of Siloam up. They would draw water from the Pool of Siloam and carry it up to the temple. Which, by the way, we, we were there the year after they discovered the Pool of Siloam. And now they've excavated the whole tunnel that leads up to the temple. These are real things, people. When you go to Israel, you will understand this is real stuff. The stones are crying out that Jesus is Lord. The stones are crying out that the Bible you hold in your phone is real. And it is true. Maybe have a paper Bible. That would be cool. Uh, they would proceed to the temple, worshiping 
waving willow branches. Here's a picture of the Pool of Siloam that's currently ex excavated. And they're in political challenges with the, the Greek Orthodox people next door. So the Israelis have been able to do this much. Can you show that picture? No, the one before it? There. That's what's excavated right now. And that is um, where we go and we preach about the, the man, the blind man, who Jesus put the mud on his eyes. And it's just a great time. People have healings there. It's a, just a wonderful place to speak about the things of God. And that's what's excavated right now. But here's a picture of what it looked like back in the day, in the time of Jesus. See the size of the people there? It's huge. It was a huge pool. And God willing, that will all be excavated at some point. So it's because water has the idea of cleansing in it, correct? Right? We're washing our hands. We're using sanitizer. We're masking ourselves. We're distancing. We're doing all these things that are external cleansing. There's something about the water of the Spirit that cleanses us on the inside. Isaiah said, therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. Are you thirsty? Are you? I'm thirsty. Are you thirsty for more of the Lord? I am. I need you, Lord. I need you more. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And Jesus fulfilled this in John 7. It was at the end of tabernacles, the end of this season in that year. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That's what happened to you. Now maybe it's gotten down to a trickle. God wants to open up a gusher. God wants to open up a gusher during this season. He wants us to be overflowing with the things of God. It's also a season of light, this, this fall feast season. And Isaiah again said, this is 800 years before Jesus was born, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And do you know that there were so many lanterns lit, there were so many menorahs, so many candelabras lit in Jerusalem, if we could see that picture, there were so many lit that they could see it for miles and miles around. You could see it in Bethlehem and some of the outskirts of Jerusalem. You could see it in the suburbs. You could see Jerusalem lit up as gold as they did that. And you know what they made the lights from? They used, they used the cast off garments of the high priest to make the wicks for the lamps. Just as our high priest is our light. And the priest, a picture of Jesus to come, the priest would their, their very garments, what they were clothed in to do service in the temple was what the, the wicks were made of for the candles, for the, for the lanterns, the lamps, that would be a blessing and light up the whole, the whole area. And they say, the rabbis have said over the centuries, if you have not been in Jerusalem during tabernacles, you have no understanding of what real joy is. Now, that's pretty cool. That means that this is a time of joy.